church. Come on, can we give Jesus praise this morning? Come on, it's 2022. You made it to another year. Let's give him a praise only a king is worthy of. Amen. Amen. We're so excited that you're here. My name is Pastor John, one of the staff members here at New Anthem Church. So blessed that you are a part of our church family. And if you are a new guest with us, we just want to say a very special welcome. We hope that uh, this day uh, is uh, special for you. We hope it feels like home to you. We want to welcome uh, not just the family in the room, but also all those watching by way of Facebook and YouTube and our app. Come on, let's welcome our online audience. Amen. We're so excited that you're here as well. And uh, we have another guest in the room, and uh, that's our Journey Church family as well. We're so excited to be doing life with you uh, together and uh, doing church together. Uh, Did you all have a great holiday season? We hope you did. We hope you did. God brought us to another year. Uh, And I have an announcement, and that is, uh, you know what? I I have a prophetic announcement. Here's this prophetic announcement, and you may even think this might be borderline prosperity gospel. This might be uh, borderline feel-good gospel, but here is my word to you. This year, 2022, will be your absolute best year. 2022 is shaping up to be your best year if it's your best year spiritually. 2022 will be your best year if it is first and foremost your best year spiritually. Now, some of y'all got bent out of shape because you were like, I hope he was going to speak prophetically to my finances and my financial goals or what I'm wanting to do with work or the, the lake house that I'm trying to buy up north. That's not what I'm talking about. God cares about those things. Those are all absolutely fantastic. But first and foremost, the king of the universe cares about your soul. And this, this year, for the health of your soul, for the health of the state of your soul, can be your absolute best year if it's your best year spiritually. This is my word for you today, church. Man, I'm fired up. This is what happens when I don't preach for a couple weeks. I come back and just like, oh, it's going to be a problem. I'm just letting you know right now. (laughs) We're jumping back into our series called Power of Love, and I absolutely love it. Um, this series. I know we went away from it a lot longer than we had planned on originally, uh, and there were some things that God was wanting us to communicate uh, in the the context of our generosity. I want to remind you, as always, we have this one last week left of our legacy offering, and uh, there are so many, even key people that have been with us since the beginning that I talked to even a couple days ago, and they're like, oh yeah, I still have to get put in the, the legacy offering. So I'm like, you know, what? we're going to give it one more week. <laughs> we're going to just, I, I know we lost a week because of the power outage, so uh, we have this week, uh, and uh, I believe uh, we're going to have an amazing announcement for what God was able to raise in this offering and all the amazing things we're going to be able to do with it. So many incredible things we're so excited to share with you uh, next week, so it's going to be a special Sunday. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about where we've been. I really want to talk about where we're going in our text today. Uh, This is Paul's letter to the church of Thessalonica, and I want to encourage you to go online to check out our series, uh, uh, go ahead and watch the first couple of uh, sessions on this uh, and talks on this topic um, to really figure out where we've been and where where Paul has been. Today, Paul is kind of shifting gears, and whereas he was talking about the state of this present early Christian church, he's now looking ahead. And he's talking about days that are to come. We're talking about the day of the Lord. And Paul is looking forward for ultimately to give us some encouragement as a church, to even wake us up as a church. If my title today had a sub-message, a subtitle, it would be Biblically Woke. Come on, turn to your neighbor, to your right or your left, to say, stay woke. 
<laughs> I just ruffled some feathers in the room. They're like, is this okay to say? Allow me to be provocative for a moment, friends. Christians are sleeping. Christians are asleep. The word of God says, wake up, O sleeper, rise from your grave. Christ will shine on you. It is the heart of God, the intention of God, the energy and the zeal of God that the followers of God would be people that are awake and alert. This is where Paul is going to be going in our text. Now, I know culture has tainted this word, just like culture has tainted the symbol of the rainbow, just like culture has tainted uh, praying in schools. Culture has tainted so much, and I understand the angst that we might have with that word, and yet I am not going to be controlled by any way that culture has tainted any kinds of word. I'm going to redeem the word this morning because we're called to be awake and alive in Christ. Paul, in our text today, is talking about the day of the Lord. Now, we don't know. There's so much theological debate on this idea. Is this, what ha- is this when Jesus returns? Is this tribulation? Is this the end of all things? Is this something that happens prior? Is it a combination of the three? It doesn't really matter. We need to know this. It doesn't really matter. That's not really the point of where Paul is t- pointing to. At some point, there's going to be an end of all things. At some point, the, le- the Lord is going to have his day and have his way. And this is the good news of the gospel. Here's the truth. For those of us that are in Christ Jesus, this doesn't have to be a day that makes us nervous. This is a day we can look forward to. This is where Paul is going as we transition to chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. The world, friends, that we're experiencing right now, today, in 2022, is full of uncertainty. Amen. The world we're experiencing today is full of calamity. Amen. And so here's what we need to get our hearts around before we dive into our text. That that God isn't looking at the calamity of our world. And and if if we make the mistake of going into our mind's eye when we pray to the God of heaven, looking at all the calamity, and we are picturing our God going, whoa, 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 hold on, this wasn't my plan. Then ultimately our view of God has been distorted by the enemy. Our view of God simply has been distorted by the enemy. Because if our God in heaven that sits on the most high throne, that sits in perfection, surrounded by heavenly hosts singing, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb, in this perfect environment of perfection, is made nervous by germs, made nervous by foreign policy, made nervous by weapons of mass destruction, then we aren't worshiping a God who holds the whole world in his hands. We're worshiping a God that ultimately we hold the world in our hands and he's watching us form and fashion the world to our liking. Friends, that is not God. That is not God. Our God is not made nervous by anything going on in our world. And this is why we can rest easy, not because things aren't weird, not because things aren't hard, but because God is in control. Are you with me this morning, church? So let's jump into our text. Let's let the word of God speak. Everything goes better when I stop talking, let the word of God speak. We're gonna let we're gonna let the word of God speak today and then we'll pray. It says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul continues his letter. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are, all chil- you are uh, of the light and children of the day. You do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. Let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading of his word today. Would you pray with me, church? Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you with hearts ready, ready for a new year, with hearts ready, ready for our best year. We pray, God, that this would be our best year spiritually. We recognize and realize the truth of your word. 
truth that would say to us that this year should have deeper relationship with you, deeper relationship with others, deeper uh, times of study and meditation in a deeper place of worship. And we can have all of it, God, if we're obedient to you and we lay down our lives to you, if we take steps closer to you. So God, would today, would this morning be a catalyst for the rest of our year? We ask this all in your name, by the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. I want to build some context for where we're going today. And Paul really sets a very specific tone when he starts out in verse 1. I want to look at the first three verses uh, and, and kind of uh, take them apart, um, kind of half by half. So when you look at the first two verses uh, of, of Thessalonians 5, it says this. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, um, we do not need to write to you. But Paul is pointing us to a truth. He doesn't know the hour Christ returning. He doesn't necessarily know what it's going to look like. That's not what he's really writing about. He says, for you know... Very well, the, the, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It will come suddenly. It will come surely. People have read this and said, Jesus is for sure coming at night. I'm just going to sleep with one eye open. No, no, no. This is, this is an analogy. This is an analogy. This isn't saying Jesus is going to come at night. It's Jesus is going to come like a thief because thieves come at night and people, while people are sleeping, while people are unaware. This is pointing us to an analogy that, that, that uh, Paul is going to be carrying out through the rest of our reading as we take it apart verse by verse today. So he says he comes like a thief. Now, there, there's a couple of reasons that, that Paul is pointing us to this truth. One was because people were made nervous. You remember when you found out about Jesus and you found out about his resurrection, that he saved you, that he has a plan for your life. You're like, this is awesome. And then you found out about, about tribulation and the end times and hell and, and, and burning torment. You heard about all these things. You're like, hold on, what? Like, can we go back? Like, I want to hear more about Jesus, but also like, wait, hold on. What, what's going on here? And we wanted to know about this. We wanted to know about the rules. And, and many of us want to know the rules so we can follow the rules. But some of us also wanted to know what we can get away with. I think Paul knew both of these tendencies. But there was also another truth that Paul was pointing to. And it's a truth found in the book of Ecclesiastes where it says that he has set eternity in the hearts of man. In other words, there's something written on every single one of our hearts. There's something inside of every one of you, inside of me, that is to be known by God, to be wondering about the deeper things of God, because God has set eternity in the hearts of man. See, Paul knew mankind's propensity and leaning towards these wonderings. Like, hold on, what's going on? When's Christ returning? What's the rules? Am I going to burn up? Like, am I get, if I'm too bad, what happens? Like, what's, what, what's going to happen? He knew there were going to be these wonderings. And he's saying, listen, I don't have all the details, but Jesus is going to return. He doesn't want us to get hung up on this, but he wants this to be a fuel for us to be active in our faith today. So some of the truth we're going to be reading was true truth specifically to this early church, Christian church. Some of the truth we're going to be reading was Paul speaking not only this truth to this early Christian church, but prophetically for us, the church, today. So we can't be reading this as a fairy tale for an ancient church. We have to re read it as a church and a mission and a mandate for us, the church, in 2022. And then he finishes in verse 3, he says this, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pain on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. What is Paul speaking about here? This is Paul speaking prophetically while also hearkening back. So he's talking about the day of the Lord, but he's also hearkening back to a repeated theme we see specifically in, in the Old Testament, where we see time after time of God had these God-ordained natural disasters, like these God-ordained uh, earthly destructions, right? Let's go back to the book of Noah. Noah was uh, the chosen by God, Noah and his family. He was told to build an ark, and what were the people of the day coming and doing? They were mocking him and they were saying everything's fine they were preaching peace safety everything's cool there's no reason to freak out there's no disaster coming there's no flood coming they were warned and what happened they were destroyed we see the same thing in Sodom and Gomorrah. They were told destruction was coming, fire and brimstone from the sky, and it happened. They were told. They were, everyone else was shouting peace 
and safety. And this land was destroyed. We see the exact same thing happen in the overflow of Babylon as well. And time after time again, you see this remnant of people, a small remnant of people that were looking at the wickedness of the day, looking at everything flying off the handles and saying, what in the world is going on? Does that sound like today to any of us? Friends, just as much as we need to maintain a love for the broken people in our world, we need to make sure that we also maintain a healthy balance and an understanding, a lucid, a lucid understanding that there is something wacky going on, that there's something broken in our world today. There's something not okay with the system and the structure of our world. And more times than not, the world's message back to you will be peace and safety. Peace and safety. In fact, the world will distract you with these words because it will be preaching peace and safety while trying to get you mad and angry and upset about something that isn't actually our eternal fight. It'll get you thinking and, and, and even emotional and angry about all these things. And I see this even in the evangelical church, that there is this, uh, this spiritual distraction and what we see in the evangelical church is those of us getting caught up in the distraction, and while we're getting caught up in the distraction about things that we're getting all emotional and angry about, we're missing the mission of the gospel in the church. And so we're dying on these hills. And God is saying, well, there's people that I've called us, that have called you to reach. And, and the church is, is yelling, yeah, yeah, but we're angry about all these things that the world is telling us to be angry about because it aligns with our political ideology. And, and Jesus is saying, I, I, I came to, to supersede all the current ideologies of the world, and I'm supposed to establish inside the vehicle of the church the way things were supposed to set up to work, and the way things are supposed to set up to work are inside of this thing called Christianity, which means walking with me, which means you may think this way, you may, you may your mindset may be this way, you, you, may, you may lean this way, and yet everything has to be filtered through the lens of Jesus. And so we're getting distracted, and we're missing it, and Satan is causing us to become distracted and miss the mission. He continues on in verse 4. Paul does. He says this, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that the day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and ch uh, children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. And so Paul now is, is starting to create distinctions. He's starting to create teams, categories. He's saying, he's saying there are those that are in darkness uh, of night, there are those of the light, and there are children of the day. And, and this is what happens. This is where so many of us as believers struggle. Because many of us, we, we love Jesus, we have a relationship with Jesus, and we struggle with something called a duplicitous life. We have this duplicitousness in our life, and let me explain what that is. When I um, got on fire for Jesus, and I was saved at a young age, and, and I started serving in the church really early, and I remember being like late high school, just out of high school, and I was ministering, and I was pastoring, I was, I was doing all this stuff like right out of high school, and I was preaching all of these things that I wasn't living out in my life. In my life, I was struggling and I was wrestling and I had these behavior issues and, and forgiveness issues and, and, and lust issues and all these things that I was wrestling and struggling with. And yet, when I would get in front of students, I'm like, hey, you guys shouldn't be doing this. And on some small level, maybe you've wrestled with that same thing. Like you're known. People look at you. You're, you're a Christian. You're a follower of Jesus. And yet, you struggle. You wrestle with the same things and you go back to the same old behaviors. And let me tell you, one of the greatest and most consistent deceptions I see the enemy doing in the evangelical church. We forget the truth of 1 Thessalonians that Paul was pointing us to, that you are a child of light. And the deception that the devil does is he convinces you that because of the sin that you're struggling with, you're not actually a child of light. You're a child of darkness masquerading as a child of light. The devil flips the script of Jesus. 
He twists it. He distorts it. Why? Because what does Jesus say? When you're a follower of Jesus, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have gone. New things have come. Romans 9 says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is a separation. Colossians says, he has transferred us, plucked us up, picked us up from the dominion of darkness and placed us into the kingdom of the son he loves. What is this truth? Is this truth not that we are no longer children of darkness when we come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we become a child of light and a child of the day. Now, this is what gets twisted. When we continue to struggle as children of light, what we're actually doing is we're masquerading as a child of darkness. We're going back to the old the old us, the old closet that was locked away, that Jesus locked away, we're breaking back in and we're putting on our old behaviors and we're putting on our own ma old masks and we begin to masquerade at what we used to be. What we used to walk in, the way we used to talk, the way we used to behave before Jesus got a hold of us. And Satan convinces us it's the other way around. This is, friends, the great deception we move on to verse 6. He says this. I want to set up camp there and preach for the rest of the time. I can't. Can't do it. So then he says, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. So he starts to give descriptors. So, so how, how does a person of the night and darkness operate? How does a person of the day and light operate? And he's starting to give us some descriptors. Those who are of the light are awake. Let's talk about being awake for a second. It, well, here's what's interesting. Just like it's necessary, uh, when you're trying to stay awake physically, it's necessary for at least most of us to have a stimulant, uh, a.k.a. caffeine. Can I get an amen coffee drinkers in the room? Thank you very much. There's only, there was a lot less of you than I thought. They're like, no, I drink tea. Okay, it's fine. It takes a stimulant, and just like it takes some kind of exterior stimulant, stimulant for us to stay awake physically, we need to know, even as followers of Jesus, it takes a stimulant to stay awake spiritually, and the stimulant given to us, already set up by the God of heaven, is the Holy Spirit. And one of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to stir things up in you, to awaken your soul to a new reality. How do we know this? Well, why do you think we gather weekly? Why do you think we gather? Why do you think we're doing house fires and we're going to your homes? We're making it real easy. We're not saying, oh, you have to come. We're going right into your homes and we're worshiping. Why do we do this? Because we're stirring up something. We're stirring up the spirit of God to awaken our souls to something. People ask me all the time, you know, so many times that I preach on a Sunday, I got in the night before at like 3 a.m. because uh, I was like working up north or coming back from some gig or some church event or something. I'm, I'm back at like 2, 3 in the morning. And people ask me all the time, like, Pastor, like you must drink like just so much coffee. You must be, you know, I, I actually can't drink coffee because if I drink coffee, then when I get home and I try to sleep, I'm just like awake the whole time and I get no sleep, right? So I can't drink coffee. Do you want to know what I do? I listen to sermons. And I, and I listen to audio of the sermon that I'm preparing for Sunday, and I'm listening to it. And what happens? The Holy Spirit starts stirring things up in me. It works like adrenaline. The staff has actually seen this play out when we're planning stuff as a staff and planning events. Like, things will start stirring up, and, and the Holy Spirit starts stirring things, and it awakens our soul. This is why. I'm, gonna, I'm going there. This is why we see, saw so many people fall asleep when they were trapped in their homes in 2020. This is why, hey, things open back up. We're allowed to go back to church. We're allowed to, people are sleeping because what happened? Well, no, they were tuning in. They were tuning in, but here's what tuning in was for most people. Tuning in for most people was they would, they would play the sermon, usually not at like the people that are tuned in right now that are, like, are awake with their coffee. God bless you. Have their Bible. They have all their stuff. They were watching it like three days later, and they would turn on their phone, and then they'd start doing chores and kind of let it play in the background. That's what it was for most people. And so what happened for so many of us, because we were disconnecting from gathering, where the people of God gather, where two or more gathered in the presence of God, and the spirit of God is there, things were no longer stirred up in the same way, and here's what happened to the church. And they nodded off to sleep, and this is what we're seeing happen. This is why we've seen hundreds and hundreds of churches die. 
We literally just talked to another church that was wanting to give us some equipment last week that just died, a multi-site church down south, like in the Bible Belt, where like no church should ever die. They just died. Because it takes consistency. It takes, it takes a sense of, of consistency and, and, and wonder and intentionality to stay awake. So we can't just stay awake by hoping we'll stay awake. Come on, that never works. It never works in real life when you're trying to stay awake physically. It doesn't work. Nah, I'm going to stay awake. You remember when you tried to stay awake for Santa? How did that go? Like, it never went well for me. I'm just like, I'm flicking myself in the eye as a kid. It never worked. It takes intentionality. You have to have a plan. You have to understand that your soul is prone to wander. Your soul is prone to fall asleep. And you have to set some things in place, not to assume I'll never turn away. I'll never stray. I'll never doubt God. I'll never, I'll never not be on fire for God. You have to assume, no, my soul is prone to do it, just like anyone's is. Just like every pastor in America, we see him falling left and right. We, my soul is, is prone to wander. So I need to set some things in place to stay awake. I stayed on that point way too long. Verse 6. So then let us be, not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake. And then they says this, sober. This word sober comes to us from the original Greek word nephalios, which means stayed, clear-headed, and temperate. Now, here's what's interesting. He's about to, Paul's about to transition into this whole idea of being drunk, being drunk at night. The word uh, drunk comes to us from the Greek word uh, methuo. And the word methuo is actually used in a myriad of different ways. In fact, many times you see it, the, um, uh, many writers uh, just threw in the word drunk, but it didn't necessarily mean that because the word methuo means to be filled. And so you have to look at the context surrounding that word. Sometimes it's in the form of being intoxicated. Sometimes it just means to be filled, uh, to overflowing, not necessarily in a negative way. Sometimes it's talking about like the overwhelming, overflowing love of God, but that same word methuo is used. So in this context, the word methuo Methuo is used, we have to look at this word sober, not necessarily as being intoxicated. This was actually more of an analogy. Paul is saying there are some things that we could overindulge on that aren't helpful. That's right. You can't just get drunk with alcohol. You can get drunk with alcohol. Have you ever met anyone that's drunk with power? <laughs> Have you ever got, seen anyone that's, that's drunk on, on just stimulation? Whether it be some kind of substance, whether it be sexual, have you ever seen someone drunk with the pursuit and the chase of money and accolades? And probably one of the most common ones I see, even in the church, is, is, is really kind of hard to pinpoint. Because it's people that get absolutely drunk on comfort and laziness. Now, here's what's interesting. No, no, not a single one of these things is necessarily bad. Like, money isn't bad. Power, influence isn't bad. Alcohol isn't a sin in and of itself. None of these things individually, even comfort, isn't necessarily a bad thing. What happens is when we overindulge on these things, this is, this is what happens. This is what people of the night do. They overindulge on every negative, unhelpful thing in life. It's easy to do when it comes to things like comfort, right? Because what are we taught, especially now more than ever? What did last year, what did the last two years teach us? Hey, your, your time's valuable. You got to hold on to it because if 2020, if 2021 taught us anything, it's like, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Things are going to get rocky. So you have to take back your time. You have to take back all of other, these other things. They're important. And so, and so you, you used to surrender those to God. Now they're yours and you can kind of give God a little bit. Right? This is what happened to so many of us, and we got caught up, we're addicted, we chase comfort. And let me tell you, your boy, like, I love to work hard, your boy loves to rest hard. Like, nobody rests harder than I do. Like, I, and I've had to learn this over the years because I used to be terrible at it, right? Like, I used to go on vacation at other churches I've worked at, and they would just text and call me all the time, and I would just still work on vacation. And they were like, well, I just knew you were going to pick up. I knew you weren't going to actually, like, like, break and actually vacation. So I just thought we'd text you and continue to call you anyways. And so I've learned over the years. Like, I, I've learned how to disconnect. I've learned how to just, like, I don't exist for the next 24 hours. I just, I've learned the art of that. 
But how many of us have been laying on a couch and we, we can hear like the kids fighting, we can hear a fire starting, something is, is happening, and we're like, I just, no, I just can't leave the couch, right? Like we, <laughs> I saw that. Um, like, like that happens though, right? Like we know that this is, we overindulge. Like we know what we should do. We know what would be better. We know what we are called to do. And yet sometimes just a night to ourselves sounds like something better, regardless of whether we know God's calling us to go to this or to that or to small group or to meet with someone or to reconcile with a family member or whatever. What's most comfortable for me it's a very hard thing to pinpoint. And so he's, he's giving us these descriptors of people of the night, people of darkness. He says, for, he says in verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Paul is continuing to push against these two categories. He says, people of the night, they're sleepers. What do we know about sleep, sleepers? You ever met someone that just kind of sleeps all day? You ever uh, been with someone, I, I, I call them bums, like they're just like a, such a bum, like they just kind of sleep all day? They don't do anything meaningful. They want to do nothing or accomplish nothing purposeful. They have no plan to accomplish anything purposeful in their life. And when he's talking about being drunk, he's talking about they overindulge those th themselves on things that are unhelpful. They satisfy themselves with things that are harmful. Now, how does that contrast from people of the day? People of the day, we're woke. We're awake. We're alert. People of the day that live pur should be living purposeful lives, living a life of meaning, and they're sober. In other words, clear-headed, empty of sinfulness. And then he says this in verse 8, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. And I'm not going to go back to the armor of God. I know some of y'all got nervous. Like, we spent like six weeks, Pastor, on the armor of God. Don't go back there. Here's all I'm going to say. This is another triad that we see repeated all throughout Paul's writings and all throughout the New Testament. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And friends, only those that are awake, only those that are woke, get to access these three key few fruits and see these fruits cultivate, grow, and develop in our life. And, and so long as you are a person of the day, you get to experience this fruit. God grows this fruit in your life. And so long as someone is a person of the night, a person of darkness, a person that is asleep, he or she will always struggle in your faith, struggle to have faith, struggle to place and anchor your faith to something sure. We'll always struggle to find hope in hopeless situations, hope in any or every area of your life, and even str struggle to show love or accept love to others or from others. And I'm talking about real love. I'm talking about agape love. Because it's from agape love that joy comes, everlasting joy, that peace wells up from, that patience wells up from, that self-control wells up from. So this triad that just kind of seems poetic, faith, hope, and love, man, this is everything. Because there is a power in love. Amen. Let's close things out this morning. In verse 9, it says this, for God did not appoint us. I love this. This is how he finishes. Friends, this is where I place my hope. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. Please, friends, never make the, never mistake the pain of your current struggle as God's wrath in your life. Don't, don't, don't make the mistake of mistaking the pain of your current struggle as, as God being wrathful in your life because Jesus Christ was sent as a rescuer and a savior for you, came all the way down into this earth, got his hands dirty, got into our mess, got into our junk, and then became our mess, became our junk, became our brokenness. Why? To absorb all of God's wrath that was meant for you. God was going to show me wrath. God was going to destroy me. Yes, because every single sin has a punishment. Our, our lives, all of our mistakes, all of our failures, all of our imperfection, they deserve a punishment. Why? Because if there was no consequence, love wouldn't matter. 
And so there has to be a consequence. There has to be bad news. Otherwise, the good news doesn't matter. And so the bad news is that there was wrath. And because God is a, is a just, loving God, he extends his wrath to sin and he punishes sin. And then here's what Jesus did. Here's our superhero Jesus. He comes in. He's like, I'm going to take all of it. I'm going to take all of it. And he was nailed to a cross. All of my sin, all of my shame, all of God's wrath and punishment, he carried. He bore all of it on the cross of Calvary and was murdered, nailed to a cross for my sin. So when God looks at me, I don't have to experience his wrath because he doesn't see my sin. Jesus absorbed all of it. Because we weren't appointed. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you were not appointed to experience his wrath. You were appointed and chosen to experience his love and relationship with him. Can we bow our heads this morning, church? I just wonder this morning who's been, who's been wondering and wandering maybe struggling in your faith, struggling with the idea that you've fallen out of God's graces, that thinking that you're a child of darkness, masquerading as a child of light. You believe that lie of the enemy. When, when the Bible declares to you that you're a child of light, if you've placed your faith, hope, and trust in him, and you just need to stop going back to those dark behaviors, I wonder if you need to experience freedom this morning. I wonder if you need to experience forgiveness. I want to give you that opportunity. Maybe you're here today. You would say, Pastor John, I need, I need to be set free. I need to be set free from myself, which I can promise you, friend, is the greatest news in the universe to be set free from yourself and your own toxic way of thinking, your own mindset, your own struggle. I need to be set free. this downward spiral that I'm on, this negative, toxic part of my life, I'm ready to cut it out. If that's you today, with all our heads bowed, all our eyes closed, I'm gonna ask right now, you just lift your hand in the air right now, wherever you're at in the room. Yes, I wanna be set free. Yes, anyone else? I wanna be set free. I wanna be set free. I wanna be set free. Yes, awesome. Yes, God sees that hand. Let's just take a moment over the next over the next little while and just, just pray, talk to God, do business with God, say, God, I give it to you. I give it to you. I know, I know I've said I already gave it to you. I surrender it to you. I'm laying it at the altar. I give it to you. I don't want, I don't want any part of it anymore. Declare over your life, you're a child of light. You're a child of light. It doesn't matter what you feel like. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It matters what you are. And if you've placed your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus, you're a child of light. You were not created to walk in darkness. There's no reason to go back to that old behavior, to that old mindset, to that old relationship. Just talk to God. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for restoring me. God, come fill this emptiness in me. God, mend this broken part of my heart, this wound, this memory that I have every time I think back to it. If my heart still hurts in the same way, God, heal that part of it, that, heart, that part that I've been scared to give to you. The, the, the part that I'm even scared for you to touch because it hurts so bad. God, surrender. Give him that thing this morning, family. Well, God of the universe, we thank you for showing up here today. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for using us. We thank you for choosing us. I thank you for every single person under the sound of my voice that took a step closer to you this morning. Would this year, this next year, 2022, God, be our best year? Would it be our best year spiritually? Would it be our best year because you are on the throne? We keep you on the throne. We keep you running things. God, we, we, set, we stand beside our will. We surrender all of our dreams all of our aspirations, everything that we want to try to figure out and accomplish, God, we give it all to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.
Church family, we love you, and we pray for you every week. We want to encourage you. You can engage with us in prayer. Maybe you have needs. You can submit prayers even anonymously. We want to encourage you to pray with us on our prayer app, or the prayer part of our app. Uh, and uh, we've been averaging 18 to 20 uh, people praying for every single prayer. So it's really been encouraging. And uh, our prayer for you will always be the same. The Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, turn his countenance towards you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Why? Because the best is yet to come. We'll see you next week. Hey, thank you so much for checking out New Anthem Church's YouTube channel. It is our heart and our prayer that this message would be encouraging and impactful for you. If you enjoyed this video, we have tons just like it already on our channel, and we would encourage you to hit the subscribe button either down below or right over here. That way you can stay up to date on when we post the messages. Now, if you don't want to wait for them to come out, we do live stream at 11 a.m. every single Sunday on Facebook at My New Anthem Church. Now here at New Anthem, our vision is so simple. We want to experience Jesus, we want to equip his people, and we want to empower the world. So with that, we want to say we love you and God bless.